<laughs> How are you all doing? You doing well? You excited to be in the house of the Lord? Before you said, there's a rule, okay? Now that I'm the mother of the house, all right, I love to greet. <laughs> yeah? All right, I want to say thank you so much for coming to the house of the Lord. There is no other better place to be. Amen? I want you to do this for me. Can you just hug yourself? Come on, I can see you. That's my hug to you guys. Thank you so much. You can sit down. <laughs> Whoa, I've got a, chair, a stool here actually, just in case the word is too heavy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go. You know what? Um, we just kick-started off a new series called Back to Basics. Now, the entire series, like literally was... Um, inspired from a single scripture found in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, where Paul is urging us. How many of you know when you hear the word urge, it means it's a warning, right? He's not saying, you know what, he's not just saying it, he's actually urging us, all right? He's urging us to move from elementary understanding to a deeper comprehension of key concepts like, you would see those words right behind me, grace, faith, repentance, baptism, eternal judgment, resurrection, and impartation. Now, Pastor Al has addressed already two of this topic, and that's grace and faith. And how many of you know that was al amazing? <laughs> Wait, did I just say al amazing? It was amazing, wasn't it? This man is really, he's got a gift for communication and literally can turn a rock into a chocolate cookie with his words. I love him. You know what, we need to take time to honor our pastor. Really, Pastor Al, thank you so much for day in and day out giving your best. You're not just my husband, you're also my pastor. It's such a joy. I feel the pressure because now you're watching me. You just give me the cue, I'll take it, okay? <laughs> but listen, be sure to check out our sermons on YouTube, share it with your loved ones, like, subscribe, and do whatever you need to get the word out. Amen? You see, back in the days, missionaries were supposed to be sent out to the world to preach the gospel. Now, it's one click away. Just one click. Click it. Okay? But today, we're going to talk on the topic, repentance. Ooh. The moment I said the word, there's quietness in the room. Okay, let's pray before we get there. Let's do that? All right. God, I thank you that your presence is here. Jesus, thank you, Father, for your reckless love. I don't know where I would be without you. Holy Spirit, you're my very best friend. I want you to come and do what only you can do. I surrender myself, the sermon that I've prepared, and what we need is a fresh breath of your air. Holy Spirit, breathe into every words and enter into the hearts of these people. Let us be pliable clay in your hands. Not just clay, but pliable, God. Break down every walls and build us with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh, come on, that's just two of you. We're having a family chat. Amen? amen. Now, what do you think of when you hear the word repent? Silence. You hear the word weeping, you hear the word crying, you hear the word judgment. It's a word you don't often hear much, do you? But it's also a, a word that's easily misunderstood. Now, repentance is really a great news for all who believe. Because it's also, it also plays an essential part of salvation. Now, so then what is repentance? Here's the thing. Many times we are told that repentance is turning from sin and turning to God. But what if I told you that's just the fruit or really the result of repentance? That's not really the definition of repentance. Okay, Pastor Leah, what does it really mean? Let's dig deeper into the concept of repentance. How many of you want to learn Greek this morning? The Greek word for repentance is metanoia. Okay, the word meta means to change, and like metamorphosis, noia actually means mind. Now, what do you get when you put them together? Change of mind, okay? To change your mind or to change the way you think, that is what repentance really means. 
Now, I'm thrilled that we're having a theological chat here. Who knew Greek could be so intriguing, right? God has given us a freedom to think. He's given us a freedom to choose. Now, our thoughts are crucial for our faith and belief because thoughts hold power. Thank God for every words and papers. Here you go. Now, as Proverbs 23 verse 7 reads, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Here's the problem. Your life is going in the direction of your thinking. How many of you know that? You are here today because of what you thought yesterday. Because mind and thoughts plays a huge important role in your Christian walk. Even if you're not a Christian, it plays with your thoughts. Now, listen, for the char- for you become the character of your thoughts. You become who you are today because of your thoughts. So here's the question. Now that we know thoughts are powerful and that God has given us the rights to decide, to choose, what do we do? What do we do with our mind? So how can we change our mind? I'm glad you asked. It begins with transformation. What do I mean by that? Not a physical transformation, but it's more an internal transformation. Because true transformation starts in the mind. Now, you won't be transformed until your mind is renewed. As God has designed the mind to be an instrument of your transformation. That is why you need a whole captive of every thought you think. It is so important what you say to yourself. It's important what you think of yourself. Now, how does this work? Romans 12, verse 2 reads, Do not be confirmed into this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, perfect, and acceptable thing of God. So what is the thing you need to do to sort of like help with your thoughts? Read the Word. Read the Word. And this is why I cannot push or press importance on how important it is to read the Word of God. Because the world can tell you anything about yourself. The world can show you how to live. But the reality is that if you have the Word of God, and if you can dig deeper into the Word of God, it will make you what it says. It will change you. It will transform you. It is unbelievable. The change is real. Now that we understand the power of thoughts and how transformation is connected to repentance, let's go a little further. You ready? Let's break the word repent. You get that into two parts, right? Re as in re from repent means to return back to the father. Just like the prodigal son, he returned to his father. Now we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory, which is why we got to learn the concept of returning. Oftentimes, it's not a concept of of making up for your mistakes, but rather just showing up. Sometimes we think because we sinned, we've got to walk away, pull ourselves away from God. And until we get ourselves sorted, we don't come to His presence. And that is fear talking. But I want you to know, repentance is making up your mind and making that turn. It's to return to your Father. It's to decide to move forward and go to your father. And instead of sorting it all by yourself, just trust the Holy Spirit. Amen? So, is repentance a one-time thing? I've heard people tell me, I got saved when I was 17. I got saved when I was 30 years of age. Or just last time, just last week was the first time I I got saved and I just repented then. So is repentance a one-time-off thing? Let me say the answer is no. It's an everyday thing. It's a lifestyle. It's supposed to be part of your prayer because we cannot enter the throne room of God without properly repenting. It's an ongoing step. As long as you live repenting every day, you can bear the fruits of repentance, which is love, joy, peace, goodness, and the list goes on. Now, the other half of the word repent is pent. Pent as in where does that word come from? Penthouse. 
How many of you like the view from the penthouse? None of you? Everyone, come on. The view from the downstairs is way different from what you see from a penthouse, true? Why? Anything and everything that looked big down looks nothing when you go up because it's the penthouse view. It's a perspective change. And that is what God is showing us in the penthouse of repentance. Now, we're not denying the fact that there, there is existence of problem down here. But the fact that a perspective can actually change your mind, can change the way you see things now, because there's a change of perspective. Now, some of us don't see repentance important because we haven't seen the penthouse yet. And God is giving us an invitation to enter into the penthouse. And the moment you enter into the penthouse, everything that you thought was so big and an issue, a problem, becomes nothing in His presence. Nothing. How do I know this? Because in the Bible, there's this man named Zacchaeus. You know, um, he was shot in stature, but he was a stingy, shrewd, arrogant man. But despite of all his problems and his reputation, he sought God. He wanted to know who Jesus was. News spread that Jesus was walking past by. He was passing by. And you know what Zacchaeus did? He's like, you know what? I need to get to him. But you know what? My shortness is coming in the way. You know, my pride is coming in the way. My weakness is coming in the way. My sin is coming in the way. Zacchaeus thought nothing of that sort in his mind. You know what he did? The moment he knew Jesus was passing by and the moment he recognized there was a weakness, that shortness thing, he decided to walk over it and overcome it. He climbed a sycamore tree. And I think that act is more spiritual than it is physical. Because the moment he climbed up the tree and he saw Jesus, Jesus called him out. Now, you think Jesus didn't know that there was Zacchaeus up the tree? He did. But sometimes Jesus is waiting for every one of us to make that change, to just jump up and quit all your weakness and your excuses and get on that sycamore tree if you can. Why? Zacchaeus was driven by a sudden desire to see things differently. This morning, I just want a question. I have a question for you all. Do you have a desire to see things differently? We all do. We all do, but it takes an act, an act of faith. Just climb up that sycamore tree. Break your pride. Break your understanding. Break everything that you knew of once and just lay it down at the feet of Jesus. Zacchaeus needed a higher perspective, a penthouse view of God's grace and mercy, which in turn led to his repentance. Here's the thing. A changed mind leads to a changed posture. A changed mind leads to a changed posture. It started with Zacchaeus thinking, God, I'm so limited, not just with my stature of shortness, but because of my pride, my mistakes. His thoughts were stalking to him otherwise. But he made up his mind. He had a desire that just came up from nowhere. So this morning, let me just tell you something. If you have the tiniest seed of desire, it can take you so much. It can take you somewhere. Now let me show you where the word repentance is first mentioned in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. A chapter later, Jesus is going around and, and preaching the same thing. Repent for the kingdom of, ha of, of heaven is at hand. Now, I want you to watch the language of John the Baptist and Jesus. They didn't say the kingdom of hell. They actually said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So just as some of us think that repentance is tied so much to hell, I want you to know it is a good news. It brings the heaven first. And here, John the Baptist and Jesus, the moment you hear the word repent, we go like, oh, repent. And we know how to play it out so well. In fact, repent has got a very strong word. No one says repent. They say repent. But I want you to now take that word and break it down to that metanoia. And now tell me what exactly Jesus and John the Baptist was actually saying. Change your mind. Change the way you live. 
repent from dead works. For John the Baptist is saying, because what, there's one coming before me, I mean, after me, and then Jesus is going, here I am. I'm the new covenant of grace and not law. Because now it's no more what you do, but it's me. Repent. Repent. It's a good word. Repentance from dead works. You know, based on what I've shared, here are some next steps you can apply when it comes to repentance. The first step is recognize. You know, you heard this word repentance, what it means, metanoia, you know it means change of mind, change your life, change the way you think. You understood where it is mentioned in the Bible, how Jesus and, and John practiced on it and preached on it. Now, how do we apply that in our personal life? The first step is recognize. How many of you find yourselves repeating the same mistakes despite asking God for forgiveness? You see yourself doing it again and again and again and again. When we cover our sins and fail to acknowledge them, we continue to stumble. Because we've learned to apologize, but we've never learned to repent. And many times, this is the problem. We think apologizing is like repenting. But that's not true. Just because you said sorry, I mean, of course, it's not too late to say sorry. You can say sorry, but that's not repenting. Repentance is not merely an emotion or a feeling of being overwhelmed. It is a decision, a decision to change. No one can make this decision for you. It must be personal desire. And I want you to understand this. I can't expect you to repent until you decide for yourself that you need to repent. And here's another thing. I can't change your heart. Oh, what? No, I can't. I don't think anyone can change anyone's heart. You can influence your mind. That will in turn change your own heart. But see, if you change your mind, God in turn can change your heart. But he has given us the first choice and the first right thing to do, and that is change your mind. And he can't change your mind unless you decide for yourself. So no matter how much I pray for you, how much I fast for you, you need to decide for yourself to make the change. And that's why the first step is to decide, to recognize, to build a desire from inside. And how do you do that? Let me think. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Build your faith. And this morning, let me tell you something. You may go like, I don't have, I don't have enough faith in me, but you have the word of God. Take the book and read it. Two scriptures, let me tell you one thing, it's like a four-course meal. Two verse is like a four-course meal. I'm telling you, you're going to walk a full. Just take the scripture and read it. Make it personal. Make it practical. Make it habitual. You can. Read the word of God. Uh, now we've got a lot of podcasts, a lot of sermons, a lot of books available to build us up encourage us but maybe what you need is not another encouraging word maybe what you need is repentance change your mind it starts with recognition it's a reminder that while we can plant seeds and water them the growth and transformation comes from the individual's own decision and relationship with god Repentance may include godly sorrow. So what are you saying, Pastor Leah? Does it mean that crying does not mean it's repenting? Repentance, you know what, may include godly sorrow. But here's the thing. Sorrow does not always include repentance. Just because you cried, it does not mean you've repented. So if repentance is not just a po being apologetic, then what exactly is it? It's like saying, God, I'm sorry, recognizing your mistakes, and making that turn, which is evident and transformative. Like the moment people see you, they know that you've been transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And here's the thing, how do I know? You will start looking less of yourself and more, more of him. Your old character begins to sort of like deplete and completely dissipate, and it starts taking on the Jesus behavior. 
There used to come a time when someone would slap me and then you would be like, I'm going to slap you back. Because that is the first initial response back. But the moment you have Jesus, the Bible says you turn your other cheek. I don't know how practical that is. But tell me about it. That's what the Bible says. It changes you. It makes you something you're not. And it makes you who you need to be. And that is like Jesus. Repentance. You know, Charles Spurgeon once said, the same sun that melts wax hardens clay. Interesting, isn't it? The same gospel which melts someone's heart to repentance hardens other people's heart to sin. Therefore, look within and acknowledge the need for repentance today. Know why you need to repent. We all need moments where we need to sit down and be critical with ourselves. Let's get real. As heaven is real, so is hell. But I know one thing for sure. None of us want to spend our eternity in hell. No. Personal repentance is necessary because unconfessed sins can hinder our relationship with God. Unconfessed sins. And we all have that. Can we not just simply humble ourselves down and go to the King of Kings and just say, Lord, I want to be, I want to be sorry, but I want, to, I want to get right. I just want to get right. I don't want to do the same thing again and again and again. I want to have a revelation. And some of us just need a revelation. And then you'll stop doing that same sin again and again and again. Repentance shouldn't bring regrets. Rather, it's a gift. What do I mean by that? It's an opportunity God is giving us. It brings comfort, not pain. Hope, not hopelessness. Faith and not fear. Love and not hatred. Life and not death. Repentance does not give regrets and it does not bring remorse. It actually brings a gift of joy. That once you repent, you feel so, so happy. So happy. So, if you're feeling broken, it's a good place to start. For the Lord is closer to the brokenhearted. Sometimes we must reach a place of brokenness to fully experience what God has for us to experience God's forgiveness and love. How do I know this? King David. You know, King David poured his heart, his broken heart out to God. And this was a king who loved God deeply. But at the height of his reign somewhere, he thought he could sin and get away with it until a prophet approached him. And you know what? Admonished him. And the Bible recounts that he sincerely repented. He first acknowledged his wrongdoing and recognized his need for God's forgiveness to restore him. And the Bible says, with a contrite and repentant heart, he sought to be made right with God once more. A repentant heart draws closer to God. A repentant heart draws closer to God. As Psalm 51 verse 17 says, my sacrifice of God is a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, God, you will not despise. Now, David is saying, God, you don't desire burnt offering or sacrifice. What you truly require is a willing heart, a heart that burns for you, a heart that's drawn to you, a heart that returns to you. The only reason we do what we do is to become more and more like Jesus. And my second point is to recalculate. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, it says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that the times of refreshing comes from the Lord. Now, we all are familiar with GPS, don't we? When we leave the route, whether accidentally or deliberately, the voice would say, recalculating. A GPS is designed not only to identify the wrong path, but also to help correct it. Then it would tell us how to get back on the right road, right? Now, the reason why we don't like our GPS is because we don't like to accept that we're wrong. Better yet, sometimes it makes you feel like you're a bad person. Can I say something truthfully today? I was being truthful all this while. But can I just be so real and candid? The struggle that I have seen in my pastoring life is that people like to be taught. 
but they never like to be disciplined and corrected. Because the moment you touch it, you see, I've not even let Jesus touch that part. Needless to say, you, pastor. Can I tell you something? If you have a problem in taking correction and discipline, seek advice, seek help. Meet maybe a spiritual-led counselor. And you'd be surprised to know that. It might take you back to your childhood. It might take you, take you back to a broken relationship. Maybe, maybe it's a lack of understanding. Always be willing. Always be willing to learn. Repentance causes a change of posture, but it starts with correcting your posture. Now, I grew up in a family with three sisters where, you know, my family believed in discipline a lot. You either admitted you're wrong and faced the consequences, or you quickly decide, learned that you don't mess with your parents. But there's one thing about my dad. I could take his correction because I know my father's heart. I know how much he loved me and how much he still loves me. Now, I've heard this thing before. Pastor Leah, I just wish this world was, I wish this world was like no sin. I wish it was peaceful where there's no sickness, no sins, nothing whatsoever. A perfect place. And I tell them, you mean like the Garden of Eden? That was a perfect place. It's found in the book of Genesis, the first chapter. And he just created Adam and Eve and he placed them. It was a beautiful family. So beautiful. They had relationship. They had fun. They had fun naming animals and plants. Can you imagine Adam would just say, rhinoceros? Okay, let's name that rhinoceros. Absolute fun. The only thing God told them was not to eat the fruits of evil and good. Just do that. And yet they still fell. It's the same perfect place like how you and I want it to be. But here's the problem. Is it about a perfect place? They still fell. They walked with God. They talked with God. They ate with God probably. They played with God. They had fun with God. Yet they fell. Could I propose something? Eve must have walked and talked with God, but she probably would have never, Adam and Eve, I'm saying, they probably wouldn't have never known the heart of God. Just because you come to church, it won't change you. Just because you pray and ask God forgiveness, that's not going to change. You might really need a proper relationship with God, and to start seeing that, you need to first start seeing his heart. The nature of God is so beautiful. The Bible says he is so patient with us. And the Bible also says God's goodness leads men to repentance. If he's giving you a second chance, it's because he loves you. He cares about you. He wants you to make it. He's put a, a separate, he, he's, he's actually kept a table like a chair specifically with your name on it in heaven. And he wants to see that place filled. That's how much he loves you. But it starts with repentance. You got to break your pride. Repentance doesn't just simply teach you new things. It also teaches you to unlearn things. Sometimes we just come like, God, I know it. Seven years of like ministry, God. I've been preaching a storm, doing evangelism and missionary and blah, blah. God. The key thing is, it, it even goes with all pastors, repent. Repent from the things you've learned too, so that God can teach you more. There is no perfect place, but there is a perfect God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just prepare as we come closer. Jesus didn't come to show miracles and healing only. 
He came to teach us love, to turn our hearts to God. I want you to know this. Oh, it's time for confession. I've made so many mistakes in my life before I became a Christian and more after I became Christian. I've made a mistake just being a child of God and also being a pastor and a minister of God. I've learned what pride can do. I, can, I, can, I know what self inferiority complex can do. I have gone through every failures in my life. But one thing is certain and something is persisting in my spirit is, Lord, I come to your mercy with a repented heart. You see, if you resist him, you can't persist him. If you're resisting what God is doing in terms of correction and discipline in your world, you can't pers persist God's favor. Maybe it's time to let go. So repentance is really a beautiful word. It is a beautiful word. It's a connection between you and God. He is a God of second chance. You know that, right? He's a God of many chances. A good God. I want to make sure that I say everything. Can we just stand up for a second, please, if that's okay? This morning, my prayer is that you would be just nothing but a pliable clay in God's hands. Don't be a tough and a hardened clay. Be pliable so God can mold you. And it starts with recognizing who He is and His heart is, and then He will change us the way He is into His image. Here's the thing. God's gift to us was His Holy Spirit. Our holy mind is our gift to Him. Whoa. Can I say that again? God's gift to mankind is the Holy Spirit. But our gift unto God is our holy mind. It starts with the renewal of your mind. Change your mind. Change the way you live. Change the way you see things. Change your perspective. Change your posture. And get on fire for Jesus. Now you've told me this, and I think I've heard this before. I've re repented many times. We'll do it again. And again. And again. When you wake up tomorrow morning, do it again. And again. And again. Until He comes. So repentance, in other words, is always going to be part of your prayer. But don't just simply say, God, I repent. Mean it, eat it, meditate on it, and act on it. Amen? You ready, church? Let's just close our eyes. In His love-driven patience, God is willing to give more time for more people to come to repentance. Now, this is God's plan to allow more people opportunity to place their trust in Christ Jesus in order to enter into eternal relationship with Him. God doesn't want anyone to perish or die because He loves you. So, Father, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus. If you can raise up your hands wherever you are, Father, we repent. We totally understand what repentance really means. It's to change our mind and change the way we see things and, the, and change the way we live. But it starts with the renewal of our mind. So God, I just pray that you would breathe your scriptures into us right now as I speak. Scripture of life. Changes. Thank you, Father. As we prepare our heart to repent once again, do only what you can do, God. Break every walls of fear and pride and the complex 
everything that we may become one with you, Jesus. I'm remembering and praying for every brothers and sisters who's raised their hands up in this room, God. Sweet Holy Spirit, can you please do what I can do? Come and fill this room with your presence and change me and them like you did and like you always do. Let the book of Acts come alive again, Jesus, because of our obedience. What you require from us is true surrender than any sacrifice, God. So we repent of our ways. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, sweet Holy Spirit. Bless their weak, their family, their health, and their children, and everything that they do, God. Let this week be a blessing, God. And let them understand and taste the fruits of repentance, God. This is the cry of my heart. Holy Spirit, fill us up. Fill us up, God. We are willing and we have a true desire to know you, God. Look, if you've never repented before and you need help, Can I please ask of you to come forward so one of our prayer leaders can actually lay hands on you, believe with you, and pray with you. Let me remind you, this is not a confession sort of a thing, but just take a step of faith if you need to. I know God is here. Pastor Al, I'll just give it to you now. You know, it's... um was speaking, I had this thought in my head. How many of you have a smartphone? And uh, how many of you know that if you don't update and things fall out of whack? And if we take time to update our smartphone, how much more should our hearts be every now and then just have a bit of surgery? And I felt as Lee was sharing this message of repentance, I felt the word I had was an update is available. An update is available. So here's what we're going to do. We've got time. Don't worry. Don't be nervous. We've got time. We're not going over time. Lunch plans are still on the menu. Don't you worry. Your favorite dish is still being dished up in your restaurant. We're going to take a couple of minutes right now. And just if I can invite the prayer team up to, I'm just going to pray for people because this is a message that needs another re. It's a response. We need to respond. The team's going to sing a song of worship. We're just going to open up the space right now. If you're saying, hey, I need to... I need to just have a reset of my mind. I need to have a reset. I'm struggling with my thoughts. I'm struggling with some mindsets and patterns. I want you to make your way to the front as we sing right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. thank you for the invitation into your presence that we can boldly come that we can cry out to you for help that we don't need to sort this thing called life on our own that we can reach out to you we thank you God for what you've done in this place we acknowledge your presence we thank you for this moment for the reality of your presence in our lives we thank you for what you've done in our hearts Lord this is not just a moment that we sort of press the end to but this is an ongoing invitation and I pray that we would take this moment, we would take this message into our Sunday into our Monday and through the rest of the weeks we thank you for this moment we give you all the glory, we give you all the honor and we make room for you we make room for you in our schedule we make room for you in our lives we make room for you this week let us be sensitive to that gentle whisper. In your name we pray. And everybody said, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen.